What tunes progressions do you feel like are always tricky no matter how much you shed them? What is this thing called love is kind of one of those things. <laughs> like I always come back to it. I'm like, oh, I wish I should be able to play more stuff on it. Uh, it's you or no one. When I start doing 12 keys of Cherokee, I kind of always feel like that. Uh, but there's certain chord progressions that I always feel kind of locked into playing the same thing. Like uh tune I was working on last week, this one. <laughs> when you get to the b section the all the all the um dominant chords so it's like the similar thing when i get when you get to like a cycle of dominant chords on um yesterday's that b minor ballad that oh, could be a ballad drum kern yesterday's but um like or like when people do like the flat six thing on the on the rhythm changes like you know this kind of thing i always find myself playing that the same exact thing how do you master those turns uh so turns i think da 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 so that it comes across uh, cleanly. Or if you do a bunch in a row. So I usually give people, I'm stealing this for this Frank Rosalino exercise that looks like this. Any tips to move from playing by ear to chord scale relationships? In high school improv sessions, well, you gotta you gotta know those scales first of all, and I find that most people actually don't know any of the scales. Um, they quote unquote know them, and they can play them th like this, you know. When you say play F mixolydian, but like when you say like improvise with that scale, there's uh, little to no application so you have to practice the application part so what i would do is find a piece of language that has the specific chord scale that you're trying to get them to play uh so in this case probably not the blue scale um given the the setting and what they probably are used to playing um and then get them to sing it and get them to play it and get play them play it in context you know so if you want them if you want them to learn how to use the altered scale don't waste a lot of time in my opinion, don't waste a lot of time trying to explain about the altered scale to them because that's going to be just boring, probably, right? And I would just say, all right, we'll give them a lick, like. Uh, you know, and be like, look, see how this sounds cool on the five chord? Um, the theory stuff comes later because they got if they're an ear player they got to be able to hear what you're trying to get them to play you know so whether that's a scale or an arpeggio or whatever same for me if i'm trying to play something new i gotta hear it be able to hear it first because if i can't hear it no chance man no chance of being able to play it when there's a chord over a bass note do you oversee does that imply bass motion or a change in function or something else it really it depends on the chord and it depends how it's being used so i'll, I'll show you so you, your example is d over c right so D, o, D over C is a C Lydian sound, right? So it's it's G major. So how do I know that from experience? But when you play D triad over C, there's an F sharp. And if you play a C major triad underneath of it, it spells out all the notes of C uh, G major, right? So for me, what I want to be able to do with any chord symbol, and you can do this with any chord symbol, whether it's a quote unquote regular chord symbol or it's a slash chord, is be able to respell it as uh, a slash chord, as a mode, and as a you know chord symbol. So D over C as a chord symbol is C major seven sharp eleven or C major nine sharp eleven to be specific, or C major thirteen sharp eleven. If you want to be extremely specific about making sure D, F sharp, and A are on the top, right? Because the 13 is the A. But when I see D over C, I think G Lydian. And that's because of knowing that what that shape implies. Now, sometimes that's different. So now if you have E over C, now you've got something completely different. 
where it's implying a different mode. So you could think, okay, so now we've got C and now we can't have G in it, in it right? Because all of a sudden that, that G is now a G sharp. So it might be perhaps like a mode of melodic minor, right? So it could be the third mode of melodic minor. So A, a melodic minor would be, could include E over C, if that makes sense. So it really depends on the composer and how they're thinking about things, you know, like if I'm playing a Wayne Shorter tune, I know he's thinking probably modally. And so if he writes D over C, it's more of a modal thing than it is um, like planing or like a sound against another sound. But in terms of uh, like, so now if you keep going with this and say like, but if it says C over E, then that's just an inversion, right? So that's C major. So it's C over E, but E over C is something else, right? Um, so that some some of that stuff is you just have to kind of learn uh, learn the music theory about that goes behind the nomenclature and then you kind of learn to identify what those sounds are. Um, but like uh, and then you said talking about bass motion. So if, if we change that to D minor over C, that would be an alternate bass note, right? Because and you would know that because it probably goes D minor, D minor over C and then to B flat or to B. B half diminished or B7 or something. Um, so you would know that based on like, if you can see the bass motion going down, then yeah, it's alternate. It's, so it can be both, but that bottom note is always gonna be the root. Or it's gonna be the note, sorry, not the root, but should be the note that the bass player plays. Um, so it can be all of those things, but there's a lot that kind of goes into the nomenclature of these things. And I think uh, just, getting a good grip on it is is important. So I, I expect my students to be able to kind of go back and forth and hopefully take a chord symbol, tell me what mode it is, and then uh, vice versa, be able to spell it uh, as, a, as a, a slash chord too. What's your mute setup on Flowers of Love Something and how do you get that vibrato so fast? My mute setup, Flowers of Love Something is just uh, Pixie Mute and Plunger. So here it is, regular old Pixie Mute. Plunger, same plunger I've had since I was in, you know, seventh grade jazz band. This piece is taken out, right? The uh, little metal piece there. So that makes it really sharp, but I think it sounds better. I practice vibrato, or I did in college practice vibrato the same way as I would practice like lip slurs or multiple tonguing or anything. So what I mean is like practice it like yeah, 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 yeah. Like. Like being able to control it in a way that's uh, metric and I do I don't really do slide vibrato that much I mostly do the kind of lip vibrato and then uh, but maybe you mean uh, I don't remember what I play but maybe it's this thing where you just kind of go Maybe that thing, maybe that's it. You just go really fast with the punch. Favorite jazz biography, which one moved you and which one didn't? I never finished, in terms of like, um, maybe the one I didn't like that much was, I could. I never was able to um, fi finish the Miles one. Because, I, I mean, I really liked it, but then by the end he gets all kind of, a little too preachy maybe. So I kind of never finished that one, to be honest. Um, and then I really, really liked the Monk one. It was very detailed and very, um, 
Very good. Very well researched, presented. Very, you know. So I, I like that one. I liked the Quincy Jones one too. I read that one. I read the Herbie one. That one was like too short for me. I felt like it wasn't uh, deep enough, but I liked it in general. Name records outside of trombone that you think aren't being exposed or listened to enough by students. I mean, just Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, <laughs> Ugetsu, uh, the one with Hammerhead on it, Free For All, actually listening to them. Um, like the Jazz Tet with Curtis Fuller and uh, Benny Golson and Art Farmer. People don't listen to that group that much. And then like more modern incarnations, like One For All, for example. And then I think actually that people do a pretty bad job of knowing what is happening on their instrument um, like now, you know, until you get to a certain level of player, like you should be investigating all the, all the people that are out there that are, you know, five to 15 years, let's say, yeah, five to 15 years older than you. So you can see what's happening, what people are doing, what kind of records they're putting out, what kind of music they're playing, what the level of their musicianship is, all that stuff like on your instrument. But I think, um, in terms of records, I, I don't know. I, there's certain. I think everybody has their records that they like. And you can get a lot of information from a lot of different records, and it's all kind of similar. When you were younger and expanding your development, what do you remember being easily frustrated with in practice? What would I get easily frustrated with? When I made the same mistake over and over and over again? Or like, I've always thought that my, one of the things that bothers me about my plans are certain notes that I'm really inconsistent about hitting, like hitting directly in the middle of and directly right on and not wondering if it's going to come out right that kind of thing so accuracy has always been a thing that's plagued me uh, and for a long time um, up, upper register playing high register playing was like uh, an Achilles heel I mean it still kind of is like I, I'm not a player that really like slams out some high notes you know like a really great lead player might be able to do just like it's not you know my not my strength you know but i know that but i mean i can play some notes and if i need to i can play play those notes but um I'm trying to get better at that so that would frustrate me a lot any tips for starting your own big band oh man um it's hard it's a lot of work um just make sure you have everything together and have low expectations, you know, like, cause it's hard. Cause it's like such a low, exp I, sorry, let me ref let me back up and explain what I mean. Like the hardest part is like managing all the people, I think all, cause there's so many people involved. And so just knowing that like your gig is going to end up probably as a low priority because you're not going to be able to pay a lot of money probably for this big man gig. And so you're kind of asking a lot of favors, you know, so n being willing to like be flexible. And then I think the one, some of the most important things is to be super organized, make sure you send out the music, make sure the music is super, super, super clear. I did a big, ba big band session back in April and you know, we just did, we literally rehearsed in the studio. So we rehearsed and then Rick mate did two takes or one take. Then we rehearsed the next tune and then did one take or two takes. And it had to be really clear and it had to be, you know, hiring the best musicians you can hire so that you can actually do something like that. Um, and then just sticking with it, man. Like if you want to do it, you got to do it and know that it's going to take a while to build up a following. But if you're passionate about passionate about it you just go for it i uh i had a collection of tunes and i really wanted to record it and and, and so we just i was like you know what i'm just gonna do this you know <laughs> just gonna do it and rip the band-aid off so you still have a private studio with openings i do have a private studio um I, it's usually only just a very few people because uh you know like over the summer i had to try to to not teach as much as during the school year. But yeah, I'd, and someone does a really related question over here on Instagram. Do you offer Skype lessons? Yeah, I've been doing Skype and Zoom lessons since 2008 or nine. So yes, I've been doing it for a long time. 
We're going to wrap this up for now, and I'll see you all later on in the summer. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for your questions. It's super cool of you to spend some time with me each Monday afternoon or Tuesday when it was on Tuesday. I appreciate that, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned. I'll post on uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, when we'll, uh, when we'll be back. But for now, I, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Wish you the best summer uh, you've had in a while. See you all later.